So I hope all this complexity this morning uh, boils down to hopefully very simple prescription guidelines. I hope. After all, as I said earlier, if you've only got three products to prescribe, it does make life a damn sight simpler, doesn't it, really? Um, so, let's have a look at some basic principles. And I, hopefully, um, people who've been prescribing in the room, um, you know, this is, there's no right answer for this. It's a very personalized medicine, it's a very personalized thing. But I think these are reasonable starting guidelines. So, I think the key, you've read it in all the books everywhere, start low and go slow. You know, it's the same with any medicine, really, isn't it? That's, don't whack in on a big dose, start at a low dose, um, and then slowly increment and see what happens. That's basic principle. And I personally, I would start for virtually everybody, pretty well everybody, uh, with a high CBD. Um, I would start with small amounts, say just five or 10 milligrams of CBD. The reason for that is there are some people who are quite sensitive, possibly, and I don't know for certain, but possibly those uh, metabolizers uh, that we mentioned earlier, maybe about 10% of the population, seem to stabilize for their pain or whatever it is on quite a surprisingly low dose of CBD. Um, and then increment it very slowly. I think many, I think that probably the average uh, in the literature and from experience, talking to people in Canada and whatever, uh, for adults, CBD is about 100 milligrams. 60 to 100 milligrams. There's some nods in the room, that's about right. Uh, but some need much higher. Some need two or 300 milligrams. And, and children, ironically, the other way around from normally, children with epilepsy need a lot more. Um, about 10 to 50 milligrams per kilogram. So for some children, that could be three, four, 500 milligrams. I'm not talking, remember, about isolates. Epidiolex, if it comes here, CBD isolate, you're needing three to four times that amount. You're needing 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams. So. CBD isolates, epidiolex, are not what we're talking about. Uh, so I'd start with five or ten, increase slowly. Uh, I'd say some need quite high doses. Then if that didn't work, I would then add in a THC, just starting very low at about a milligram, building that up. The problem we've got is that the Canadians who dominate the field in many ways tend to produce fixed ratios, and I think that I don't know why they do that, because then you're stuck with a 1 to 25 or a one to 2 to 100 ratio. And what you really need to do is titrate separately. You need to increase the CBD alone. Well, some people only need CBD. And then you add in a bit of TC and titrate that separately. Why on earth? So there's a room. Helios, where are you? For God's sake, produce a CBD and a THC variety so you can titrate it separately. Then you can dominate the world market. Where are you? <laughs> They've gone. Is that all right? Good. Do that. They didn't pay me to say that either. That's the man on the radio asked me this morning how much I was getting paid for this. I'm not, incidentally, <laughs> except my airfare. Some might need higher doses of THC, maybe up to 20 milligrams on average. I mean, some need a lot more, some need less. It's a very personalized medicine. I think that's a point to emphasize. Uh, there's not a, like, a, a new antihypertensive. You can learn about it in five minutes. That's the dose. Get on with it. Uh, cannabis medicine is not like that. It does take a lot of trial and error. Because there's so much we don't know. That's the principle. Full extract products need much low dose. And ISIT said that. Remember about bioavailability, although in practical terms, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference for the reasons I mentioned earlier about 11 hydroxy THC being more psychoactive and such like. Um, but that's the principles. We'll go through that in a bit more detail now. Uh, I think there's a difference in prescription between those who are naive and never tried it before and those who are not naive because you can basically go a bit higher with a bit more THC at the beginning because there's a lot of people who come to pain clinics and such like who are, frankly have already used illegal recreational street cannabis and therefore you don't need to start low. So vaping, we've said this a bit but it sort of brings it together. Maximum levels of THC in the blood within minutes, two or three minutes if you're vaping. You peak at 15 to 30 minutes and it decreases over about two to three hours, roughly speaking. So it's quite a, a big boost and you get, a, you get more of a hit, you get more of a high for using a THC product because uh, it peaks higher in, in the blood. So it's very useful for, not useful for some things, but useful for other episodic disorders. As a rescue medication, you could call it that, for uh, breakthrough pain, for cluster headaches, headache, uh, headaches generally, trigeminal neuralgia maybe those sort of um, more acute pain that dies away again. Um, it's quite useful, uh, particularly for pain patients when they, get the, uh, uh, when they can perhaps predict uh, when they're going to get more pain, if they're going to 
uh, go out and get in a car or go to a restaurant or something like that. Um, so they're more likely to feel higher than the THC product. The oil, of course, to state the obvious, it's a slow onset, it lasts longer, it peaks around two hours, lasts four to 12 hours, depending on a lot of uh, parameters. But it's a bit more predictable and it avoids that wild up and down that you get from the vaping. So it's a lot of background effect. Um, less likely to get high even with the same dose, actual dose of THC because of that longer duration of effect. And topicals, of course, are pretty safe and non-intoxicating. Small areas of localized pain and for some skin conditions, as it says there, we heard earlier, acne, for example. So that's the obvious principle, just, just to state the obvious. So this is obvious, you know, you're looking at a CBD, at the right hand side is so one, one way round in a sense, and you're looking at the psychotropic intoxicating effect on the left hand side. And, but we often end up with products balanced, with different balance ratios in between. So we very rarely need a very high THC product with no or little CBD, like a street cannabis is very rarely needed in medicine. So. Naive patients start with high CBD oil. Depends on what's available. 1 to 20, 1 to 25. I think here's Tilray 1 to 25. Is it available? Pure CBD. It's pure CBD. Okay. Is it 2 to 100 available as well? No, because the United Nations Single Convention oh. labels it as a narcotic. Okay. If they can't bring it in as a narcotic, then sell it as CBD. Okay. Right. So the Tilray is 100%? Is, is yeah, pure CBD. But not an isolate? It's purified CBD. Okay. Right. <laughs> Ideally, if you have it available, um, start with high CBD oil. Uh, those sort of doses which you mentioned already. There's not really a ceiling. There's not a maximum dose for CBD, I don't think. Um, it says there, take consistently with or without food. I'm not sure that makes much difference, to be honest but be okay, you can get some consistency if you do that. And avoid having THC daytime to totally unaid patients. Start, if you need to, start with THC at night. Makes sense. So basically, off all the complexity this morning, it's pretty simple. Whatever you've got, whatever patient's got, whether it's gastrointestinal or pain or epilepsy, start with a high CBD oil, unless you want to vape for the pain. And that, this is Danny Gordon's lady I mentioned earlier. Uh, suggestion. I think again, Danny's very cautious. I don't differ with being cautious, but I think a very slow titration, uh, particularly of uh, THC, makes some sense. So add one or two milligrams of THC oil at night if the CBD hasn't worked, whatever, whatever we're using it for, remember. Um, increasing slowly every two to five days by one to two milligrams, as it says there, and you, over 20 days, you've built up to about nine milligrams of THC. That's hugely variable. It's just a very crude guide. Some would eat more slowly than that. Some wouldn't, some wouldn't get to nine at all. Some would be fine at three or four milligrams or something of that order. So it's a very slow incremental increase of THC. So basically don't whack high THC in, uh, particularly in the daytime. Non-naive patients, basically the difference is you can afford to go up a bit higher a bit quicker. Basically, that's all it is because they've been using street uh, cannabis, which is high in THC anyway. So um, considering the small amount of daytime THC right from the start, depends what they've been using. And of course, the trouble is a lot of people don't know what they've been using because they got it from the street and they don't know what's in it. Uh, we need to make the assumption probably that it's got reasonably high THC. Uh, so you could start adding a little bit of THC earlier on than you would with a naive patient. Uh, keep the CBD ratio high, more CBD at first, increase the THC, um, and then basically just titrate it up or down according to response. It's simple. Um, and you could, at the bottom one there, okay, if they've been, been self-medicating a long time and you think they've been using high THC, uh, and some use very high THC, come but start off with a balanced one-to-one -one product. So basically the message of that slide is simply you can launch into THC if need be for pain a bit earlier than you would for the naive patient where you have to titrate up through the CBDs first. There's a difference. I mean, a lot of the Canadian producers say they've got Sativex and Indica strains. A Sativex uh, high THC or high CBD or whatever it is. Is it probably is a bit of difference? Probably. Um, maybe one should use indica strains for 
if they're available, and I'll, I'll show you an example of what's available for one of the big uh, manufacturers in a moment, you should try an indica strain at night because it's more sedating and therefore more appropriate at night. If you try a sativa strain at night, it could keep them awake because it's more alerting. That's the difference, if it makes a difference. And I say indica sativa is, is, is not clear cut, but generally, if there is a choice, and you will have a choice over the next year, hopefully, I would use indica at night and sativa in the daytime. Uh, low in myrcene, myrcene is very sedative, if you, and again, if you want a nighttime sedation or for help pain at night, then using a high indica with as high in myrcene, that terpene that's quite sedative is quite useful, if the company tells you what's in it. And a lot of the companies don't give you a terpene profile, which is not helpful. I think everyone, and I think if I was encouraging the New Zealand regulators, I would say that for God's sake, re, um, make sure that what's on the label is what's in the product and, and force people to say what's in it. Uh, so we know the cannabinoid profile. Even if it's a tiny little bit of CBC or CBG, tell us. Then we can learn and tell us what the terpenes are because they're really important. Tell us what's in it. And a lot of people just don't. So it's all very well me saying find an indica strain high in myrcene, but actually, in practical terms, most of the manufacturers in Canada, uh, you won't know what's in the damn stuff. You can insist on a certificate of analysis, and I, in the early days I would. We have got some products in the UK now, which I'm refusing to prescribe until they tell me what the terpene profile is. They can do that. It takes less than a day. You just send it to a lab that does these things, and you get a terpene profile back. So we need to learn from this. Uh, so I would be a bit robust about saying, I'm not using this product, you tell me what's in it. And then we can learn. For this, this sort of patient, maybe need a high mercy. For that sort of patient, it might need a high linoleum for epilepsy. We don't know that. So let's, let's force people to tell us. Should it be much about storage and the practicalities of those who prescribe? I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. It makes sense for to the patients to keep in a cool, dark place away from direct sunlight. Does that make any difference? I'm looking at people who've used it. I don't think it makes much difference, does it? Over the short period of time. It might, um, said, it's said in theory not to put the flour in a plastic bag, as pinene and limonene and solvents can dissolve the plastic. Mm, we don't know. It's theoretical. OK. Um, keeping an air container. Uh, Mercine is lost first. So again, it depends on how long you've stored it. It's a slightly different product from day one to day 90. But hopefully, if you're prescribed in the right dosage, it's all going to be used fairly quickly anyway. So THC degrades. <coughs> THCA degrades over time. After about 90 days, it starts to oxidize, uh, degrade, decarboxylates, and THC starts to oxidize to CBN. Uh, so you, the properties will change if you use an out-of-date stuff, basically. But it shouldn't, that shouldn't apply. So let's just summarize that, which is very straightforward. Use oral oils as the base of therapy. I think that's true for most things, if not everything. Start with high CBD oil for daytime. Add THC indica, if you've got indica, for sleep and or severe night pain. Always use CBD to buffer the THC effect. Add in vaporized products for acute or rescue or breakthrough pain if needed, and there's no contraindications. And effect, uh, other point to make, actually, is the effect, particularly in epilepsy, can take weeks. And again, I said coming back to dear old Alfie, who did change the law, bless him, but um, it took six weeks um, at a high CBD for it to have any effect. For five weeks, it did nothing. But in fairness to the parents, it just carried on. And the sixth week, it began to have an effect. And that's something also don't expect. If you, you prescribe, it hasn't worked after a fortnight. Oh, it's not going to work, or you increase the dose. And uh, it says, seem for epilepsy at least, that it can take several weeks to have an effect. And God knows why. I have no idea why. No idea at all. Uh, but it does take, and that's, that's a consistent finding four to six weeks to have an effect in epilepsy. So it's a long, rather prolonged process. So don't panic, hold your breath, and wait. But there's a balance between waiting six weeks for every dose increment, isn't there? And um, otherwise you'll be there a year later. And in increasing it at a sensible speed, it's, it's very difficult sometimes. But it is to remember not to dismiss it as not working if it hasn't worked, after, certainly after a few days. I've just used expect, uh, an example of spectrum. Uh, canopy growth. I have no shares in canopy growth. That's all to have shares in canopy growth. I just picked this at random. Um, I didn't know Tilroy is available here, um, but I picked canopy just to give you an example of, of uh, uh, this is the largest Canadian producer. It's the, it's the largest cannabis company in the world. 
Um, it produces a, a range, a whole range of other recreational products as well these days, produces spectrum therapeutics. Um, they produce in oil, they produce soft gels, better for some people, or children particularly, take two capsules three times a day, whatever, um, and flour. And you can have proper flour or already milled flour, or you've already ground the flour up for, ready for vaping. They do produce indica strains, sativa strains, and hybrid strains. That's quite a choice. The oils come in high CBD oil. That's less than one milligram per mil of THC and 20 milligrams per mil of CBD as a hybrid. They use a balance range, 10-10. And they use a high THC, but 26 milligrams per mil, less than one milligram per mil of CBD, both as indica and both as sativa. If you remember what I've just said, then that's the full choice you need. You've got indica, you've got oils, uh, you've got high CBD, balanced and high THC, um, and that's it's a similar range to the oils in, in soft gel and in flour. And that's all you need, really. So that's one manufacturer. What's the point of having more manufacturers? Well, that's obviously a market decision. But also, there are some people, because of the full extract product, that won't suit this particular range, presumably because of the strain they use. And, will, and the same, apparently the same dosage of THC or CBD will work with another strain. I'll come to what do we do when they develop tolerance in a bit, but you basically you strain swap. So if the Spectrum product hasn't worked, you swap to a different product, Bedrocan or Tilray or something else, and that might work in apparently the same dosage. But that's a typical range from a typical Canadian company, and that would cover every possible aspect of what you need to prescribe. And that's what it looks like. 40 mil bottle, and it comes with a syringe, and it does give the terpene profile. And I think that's a good example of what we need in New Zealand um, and hopefully what will be provided in New Zealand. All right, what do we do about tolerance? And this happens. Um, um, it's highly anecdotal, but in a, of course the company, GW particularly, don't say this, because it's a bit negative, but it wears off in some people. After, the average is about 11 months, in fact, um, about a year. Uh, it, it applies to epilepsy. It, don't, it doesn't appear to apply so much to pain or the other indications, but it does apply to epilepsy. Epilepsy seems to behave very differently. It takes longer to kick in, and it get, you get tolerance. So what do you do with tolerance? To by tolerance, that, that may not be the right exact uh, pharmacological word, so forgive me, but basically it wears off. Uh, seizures begin to come back. So what do you do? Um, you can try increasing the dose. You can try decreasing the dose. Now, why do I say that? And again, forgive me if the pharmacologist and there's a biphasic response. I'm not sure if I'm using the term correctly here. But basically, what I mean by that, and correct me if it's the wrong term, is there's a, for an individual, there's an there's a optimal dose. Let's say it's 200 milligrams of CBD. You don't know that, unfortunately. So you increase at 10, 20, 50, 100. You get up and you get more and more effect. You get more and, more, and once you get to 200, you go past that, you keep going because you don't know the response, and then the response gets less. 250, because you pass that peak. You pass the, the optimal dose of 250, so it goes uh, to 200. So you keep going 250, 300, the effect gets worse. And you bring it back a bit, and it gets better again. So you can increase the dose because you might not be using enough, but you can also try decreasing the dose because you might have passed that optimal peak. Now, is, that, is biphasic response the right term for that? Okay, no one differs with me, so that's the right term for that. It's the biphasic response. So you can try increasing the dose, because you might not have used enough, of either component, or try decreasing the dose of either component, because you might have passed the optimal dose. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an odd thing. You can try, like a lot of medication, you can go to drug holiday. And I don't pretend to understand the mechanism. People come up with all sorts of fancy terms of why this works, but stop. Um, and some of the children stop for just 24 hours and it starts and it seems to work again. Some stop for a week. Now that's not easy in epilepsy, I fully appreciate that, but sometimes you have to, you have to try something. So a drug holiday, for want of a better word, can sometimes help. But more, more commonly, what you do is strain swap. Because presumably, because of all the other stuff in different strains, so you may be using the same dose of CBD and the same dose of THC, but because it's a different strain, it seems to have a different effect. Presumably because it's got different terpenes and different minor cannabinoids in it, maybe different flavonoids in it. And some people in Canada now, for the children with epilepsy, are strain swapping every day. So you do strain A, Monday, strain B, Tuesday, strain A, Wednesday, strain B, Thursday. Some are doing 
week on, week off. With Alfie, we're now doing month on, month off. Um, the other thing you can do with epilepsy, maybe other things, as I said earlier, some children can't tolerate THC, so you try THCA, which seems to have the same epileptic, uh, anti-epileptic effect, but is not psychoactive. And some children who can't tolerate more than a few milligrams of THC can tolerate usually up to about 1 in 10 ratio. So if you're on 300 milligrams of CBD, they can tolerate about 30 milligrams of THCA. So there are, uh, there are manufacturers, uh, one, Aurora, who produce a THCA strain. But it's very unusual. But I think it, we need, again, more choice. Um, THCA is very difficult to extract because it needs to be extracted cold, and that's not easy. If the extractor's in the room, it's not easy to get a, a stable THCA if it doesn't break down to THC. So there are things you can try. Increase dose, decrease dose, stop for a short time, strain swaps, probably the best thing to do, or try THCA or CBDA, in fact. So there are, if it begins not to work, don't give up. There's a lot that can be tried, if there's the product available to try, of course. That's the other thing. A quick geography break. I was asked to mention how it is in the rest of the world. So I'm going to go through this very, very quickly, because I don't, you don't want the details of the regulated requirements in Latvia, unless you're Latvian. Um, green is uh, medical, in various shapes and forms is now legal or approved or in, it's, it's very very different country to country very different so most of Western Europe is now medical cannabis in various shapes and forms is legal generally Eastern Europe it's not and if we go around the world very briefly I won't, I, I won't read them all out you know Argentina, Colombia having said I'm just going to read them out aren't I you can read them yourself. You know, it's becoming legal in a lot part of Latin America. It's uh, legal in various ways that we just thought you know about Zealand. Vanu I gather the other one is Vanuatu. Anyone know that? Any other Oceania countries that I missed out that it's now legal? No. Okay. Asia, surprisingly, that's becoming uh, Thailand very recently. Countries where you could um, be seriously, seriously imprisoned. Uh, for possession, still can, it's now legal medically. So it's becoming all over the world, really. Uh, un unenforced or decriminalized in Laos, Vietnam, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar. It's now legal in North Korea, incidentally. That's one good thing in North Korea. <laughs> Africa, a bit behind the times, but Lesotho is uh, a very popular and produces very good cannabis. Caribbean, Jamaica, not surprisingly, Puerto Rico, Mexico, North America. Now, the majority of North America, of course, it's still federally legal, but that's going to break down within a year to be federally legal in the States. It has to be. Uh, Canada, of course, is legal for recreation as well. So, overall, this now, my best of my count, this changes literally weekly. Literally weekly. I did this last week, and it's up to date at this point in time. There's 50 countries worldwide. Uh, where it's legal or decriminalized. So the, 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 the dominoes are falling, as it were. There's still 148 countries to go, I think, if there's 198 in the world. But we're getting there. Um, the other thing, briefly to mention, because it, it is actually quite important, is travel advice. When you can prescribe it here, can you, you've got to be careful about advising people. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you can travel with it. You can't enter other, some other countries with it where it's illegal, not surprising, even if you've got a valid New Zealand prescription. And the other thing is to remember transit points. And in the UK, we use Dubai a lot for transit, for international connections, and it's illegal there. CBD as well as THC. So, you know, strictly speaking, you can get imprisoned in Dubai if you pass through with it, even if you're transiting from one legal ent entity to another legal entity. So people need to know that, need to take that risk. Um, if they want to take the risk, but they need to know the, the truth of the matter. So that's just an important point to remember. That, uh, holiday advice is quite uh, common to, to ask and need to know where they're going and where they're going through. Uh, this is one slide before I move on to the case report things. How are we doing here? Uh, is, this is just mentioned a bit. Can it, can, I don't know if it exists. But, uh, some say it does. Clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. I just threw this in here. It's not. In, it's out of place, really. But I couldn't think where else to put it. Uh, basically, there's a thought that the endocannabinoid tone may be reduced, and it's associated with IBS, um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. What the hell does FMS stand for? 
Thank you, five out. Thank you very much. I've forgotten what it was. Migraine and depression. Um, and some would say those are linked together. Probably true uh, as a sort of a, a clinical endocannabinoid syndrome, if you like. I'm not sure. I just put that in because, because it's in the exam. So let's have a look at a few cases. You can tell me. There's about five of these and I've finished. These are real cases from my colleague uh, Danny Gordon. So let's have a look at Dave. He's a 55-year-old male. He has absent seizures and traumatic headaches, or traumatic, post-traumatic headaches, I should say, after he had a brain injury when metal scaffolding fell on his head. He has memory, typical brain injury, memory issues, uh, fatigue. He's a naive user. He hasn't used cannabis before. And there are the drugs he's on, which I won't go through, but note Clobazam, maybe, is the one to note. So what would... Uh, I could ask you, I suppose, it's just, it's just to emphasize this is quite easy, what would we use for this guy? What was used for this guy? Anyone want to tell me? Well, I'll tell you. We started, it's all the same, so it doesn't get, it gets easy. Uh, start on a low dose CBD, you started on a 20 to 1 ratio. Uh, 20 milligrams of CBD to 1 milligram of THC, because of this ridiculous fixed ratio business in Canada. Um, or for daytime use. He started low at 2.5 milligrams uh, of CBD three times a day, 7.5 milligrams a day, very little. It had some effect, but it increased it slowly to 100 milligrams, which is a solid average adult dose, pretty good dose, 60 or 100 being about the average, you remember. Uh, it had some effect, but not perhaps enough. This was on his epilepsy and his pain. Um, so they introduced THC indica, oil at night, just 2.5 milligrams, and ended up at 5 milligrams. So quite low, so we ended up on 100 milligrams of CBD and 5 milligrams of THC. Did that, and they also then, for breakthrough pain, uh, he was given a vape strain um, of that um, balanced CBD THC, sativa dominant. And it was myrcene rich, if you can get that. As I say, that's useful because uh, he, he used mercine rich and indica dominant strain for evening. So he, he, he vaped in the daytime with a sativa strain, balanced sativa strain, and at night time with that mercine rich indica strain. Okay, so that's not too complicated. Four month follow up, morphine 50% reduction, increased energy, better pain control, and there was no issues with clobazam despite monitoring the levels. So that's a pretty standard treatment. CBD, then THC, then if need be, vape for the breakthrough pain in between. Same principle with Chris. Yeah, anxiety and depression this time. A long list of um, uh, treatments tried without effect, particularly. Depression, anxiety for 20 plus years with insomnia. So you think that's pretty resistant. Um, he's a naive user. So uh, what are we going to do with him? No great prizes. Naive user. CBD, thank you very much. High CBD oil, 20 to 1, daytime after titrating, he ended up on 60 milligrams a day, 30 milligrams BD. So that's again, average dose. Um, but then added in a balanced THC CBD oil, indica dominant for sleep. And he averaged 10, 15 milligrams of THC and therefore 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams of CBD. Simple, that's all he had. Oil in the daytime and a slightly, uh, a little bit of THC in the evening. And that produced a dramatic reduction in anxiety and depression. He was sleeping eight hours most nights, no side effects at all. And he was able to pick up a hobby of golfing and was too depressed to commit to any regular activities. So again, these are all success. So you would not be surprised that these are success stories. I'm going to, going to put up those that didn't work. Uh, but these are, it just gives you an idea of, of, a, of a treatment plan. Yes. He's an experienced user. Difference. That's the only difference here. He's an experienced user. Uh, opioid dependency, chronic pain. Uh, busy three young children, disability, workplace, injury, pain was unmanageable, visibly depressed. Okay? But the difference is that he's used street cannabis. What do we do with him? At a, I come over here, I can't, it's too close for me. Again, high CBD oil. Right, so they started 20 milligrams, so we started higher, 20 milligrams BD, started at 40, went up to 120 quite quickly, 
at the same time adding in a THC indica oil before bedtime, starting at two and a half milligrams at night, soon up to 10 milligrams. So basically then you differ the same principle, but you go higher quicker and add in THC much earlier. That's all it is because he's used to it. Uh, then they added a THC sativa oil mixed into the daytime CBD dose. Um, so it was on quite a bit. If you add that up, um, about 10 milligrams of THC at night and 6 milligrams a day, so it was up to 16 milligrams of THC altogether and 120 milligrams of CBD. Then you try to reduce that to the minimum effective level, of course, as in principle. And six months later with that, he was off opioids completely. He was mainly using the CBD in the daytime. And he did occasionally vape for acute pain, but he was able to get back to his job, a part-time job, um, play with his children, etc. So the only difference there is jumping in earlier with THC. I think two more. A young lady with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, very disabled, on a variety of drugs. You can see very tired, significant pain, eight, eight or nine out of ten on most days, for most of the day. Um, she was trying to complete her degree, but really had to stop, and she was a naive user. Okay. So what are you going to do with her? Naive user. Lo and behold, high CBD, oil for daytime, dosed in the morning first thing and mid-afternoon. And then when she got to 60 milligrams, that's the sort of magic number, uh, if you haven't worked to 60 milligrams, then think about adding in THC. Uh, you added in a sativa THC oil, two milligrams in the morning. And then a THC indica for very disrupted sleep and night pain. Uh, so she was on, what's that, Started very small amount, 2.5 noctase, seven milligrams started to get effect and she then titrates up and down a little bit. She keeps under 10 milligrams at night, not used every night. So there's a, there's a personalized, you can, you know, you needn't be rigid about this. People can adjust it according to their symptoms over, over a, a few weeks or a few months or whatever. Um, so that's again, fairly average. And that worked with her. She was able to go back to school. Her sleep was improved, her pain had decreased. No side effects particularly, and had not needed steroids for the first time in years. Any more? No. So you get the principle. I didn't want to label the point. So actually, despite all that complexity this morning, it comes down to relatively simple CBD come THC until we have more products available. Right. I've got about two minutes. Um, I was asked to put in something about the UK Medical Cannabis Clinics, changing the topic again. Um, this may not be relevant to you, but we've set up three clinics now. Uh, we have a referral from, uh, from anyone, GP hospital consultant. Because of the resistance in the system, we do allow people to self-refer, but we have to make sure that they're genuine in the sense that they see our own homegrown clinic, uh, GP in the clinic, who can check them over and also we can, our GPs are, are obliged to send a, a summary, even if they can't stand cannabis and don't want us to use it, uh, they have to send a summary if the patient requires it. So we can guarantee that they're genuine um, people. They're then seen by the, the, either the GP or directly, they see the relevant specialists. We have gastroenterology, pain, psychiatry, and neurology consultants. We will do, we're still waiting for the thing to open. Um, prescription is written, take it to a local pharmacy. And that's it. From the clinic point of view, immediately, we have nothing to do with the prescription of the product. Obviously, then follow up at a month. And we do a rigid now in, in data collection, whatever relevant pain scores, spasticity scores, hospital anxiety, depression, whatever is appropriate, we monitor. We want to collect this data. I think that's important to any clinic opening in private sector to collect the data. And there's a contact phone line to the GP or nurse or, um, uh, soon if there's a difficulty in between the appointments. But they take this thing to the local pharmacy, and the local pharmacy then gets the supply. The clinic has nothing to do with supply, and the doctors can prescribe whatever product is available. So I was just asked to put that in about the limited experiences, three private clinics in the UK at the present time, uh, all waiting to be opened when we get approval from the fund, a body called the Care Quality Commission that has to approve us. They take 10 weeks on average to approve any hospital or new clinic, and they've so far taken 22 weeks uh, to think about approving us. At the 10 week mark, they said, we now realize you're a medic or cannabis clinic, so we're gonna to have to take you more seriously. Uh, as though they don't take other things seriously, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so there's still a lot of bureaucracy in the UK that we have to overcome. And finally, uh, this is very quick, because uh, you're sure you're not interested in the detail of UK regulations, but just to compare to what you might have and show you what's good and what's bad about it, 
Um, a doctor can prescribe in the UK. Um, uh, this, is, this is lovely political speak. Uh, it needs to be a product which contains cannabis. That's a good start. Um, it's produced for medicinal use and is a medicinal product. I'm not quite sure the difference between A and B. Um, a medicinal use for medicinal product. Um, but that does exclude CBD by definition, because you can't sell CBD in the UK, because by definition it's not made as a medicinal product. Because it can't be sold as a medicinal product, so therefore you can't prescribe it. So there's a catch-22 in there, which is patently stupid. Um, it's a, we have to prescribe under what we, call, what we call the special system. I think it's just an unapproved system for you. Is that what its title is? Uh, but that does mean that the doctor has to take personal responsibility for that prescription. That's one reason why some doctors have been a, a bit against it, because they have to take personal responsibility as opposed to a licensed medicine within the licensed conditions which the company takes responsibility for. Um, we can prescribe in any format, as I mentioned earlier, except smoking. And for any condition at all. That's quite liberal, actually. Any condition where the doctor thinks it's in the patient's interest to do so, take into account the evidence and the guidelines. And a, a doctor on the specialist register only, that's basically hospital consultants, can prescribe. GPs cannot prescribe except under the direct, the direct direction of the specialist. So I can direct the GP to prescribe it. He, has, he or she has no choice. That's the only way around the regulations. There is one GP in the UK prescribing, and that's for Alfie. One. 99% won't, there's been 22 prescriptions written and none in the National Health Service. So there's something gone wrong. Again, there's 2 million, there's 22 prescribed, all privately, all ridiculously expensive for the reasons I've said. Yes, a doctor on the NHS can prescribe it, but not one has, not one. There were two children before the law changed um, who were special cases, Alfie and one other. Um, and they're still prescribed on the NHS, but none since the law changed. None. Why not any? And I just put this up, which may apply to varying degrees here, I don't know. Ignorance. And I mean that nicely, I don't mean that rudely. I was quoted, I went to the Isle of Man to give a talk, and it says, uh, doctor calls fellow doctors ignorant. It, didn't, it wasn't quite what I said. I said there was ignorance about the lack of education, because that's not a fault of anyone's. That's why we're here today is to learn about it. Um, so teaching, I think, is absolutely essential like today. And that's the main reason I think people don't want to prescribe, because they don't understand it and don't know what to prescribe or what dose, which is perfectly reasonable. I don't want my doctor to prescribe if he doesn't know what he's talking about or she. Number two is the lack of, some say there's lack of evidence. I don't agree with that. We need more evidence. Absolutely need more evidence, a lot more evidence over years. I think there's enough to prescribe for those who are desperate, who for, for pain, for epilepsy, uh, who reach the end of the road of licensed. I, think, uh, I don't think it's a last choice, but I, think, I th absolutely think there's enough evidence to, to prescribe and learn as we go along, not wait for more evidence that may take years to come. So I don't agree with that. Then there were guidelines produced. You may, you may have this problem as well, eventually, produced by the Royal College of Physicians. I've already been rude about the BPNA. I've been rude about, and I'll be rude about them again. And they've said that the RCP is bouncing in excitement. Uh, there's no robust evidence of the use of cannabis-based medicinal products for chronic pain, and the use is not recommended. And it's a brave doctor that goes against those recommendations. And a doctor in the hospital has to get approval from the hospital hierarchy, like the medical director. And it's an even braver medical director who say, I think you can prescribe against the Royal College recommendations. No, that hasn't happened. There's two barriers to prescription, and the third barrier is cost, but we'll come to that. So I fundamentally disagree with that. The BPNA is even worse. Um, prescription of a non-licensed cannabis product for medicinal use should be used for the treatment of last resort. I don't agree with that. You could argue that in a sense if you mean it sensibly. Not every, every known anticonvulsant in the book, but a reasonable choice of licensed medications. They've got to have epilepsy. It's proven intractable. Fair enough. Not responded to a ketogenic diet or not candidates for epilepsy surgery. So the BPNA in their wisdom has said you can operate on a child's brain before you try cannabis. I think that's verging on the amoral, frankly, and have said so. We recommend that patients who are already taking other cannabinoid products of a GMP standard 
already taking it and working, uh, are transitioned to CBD Epidiolex. So is that not wrong medicine? They're on something that's working, and let's take them off that and try them on something that might not work. I find that just mind-blowingly ridiculous. The people who wrote this were responsible for the Epidiolex trials in the UK. Draw your own conclusions. So we formed the Medical Cannabis Collision Society, which should produce better guidelines. I would say that, as I wrote them. <laughs> uh, they're, they're very good guidelines, and they're online. If they're helpful, please feel free to go to ukmccs.org. The website's pretty rubbish at the moment. There's a new one about to come out. On there, you can download the guidelines and see what you think of them. You can download the RCP guidelines and the BPNA guidelines if you want to compare them. Um, they're publicly available documents. I, th I think they're sensible. They're not hugely silly pro-cannabis, they're balanced, I'd go. But I'd say, it's up to you to decide that. Ping, nearly finished. Uh, it's an unlicensed medicine that said doctors have to take personal responsibility. That's, some people have said that's an issue. Um, I put that on the side because, as I said before, you can't kill anyone with cannabis. You're more likely to, if those stacks of cannabis fall on you, you're more likely to die than smoking them off. <laughs> you have to smoke that amount in 15 minutes. There was, I went as an audience once and some guy at the back, it was a lay audience, said, I want to try that experiment. <laughs> so, try 1,500 pounds of cannabis in 15 minutes. Um, there's bureaucracy, as I said, going up to the medical director. I hope you don't get bogged down in bureaucracy of getting multiple layers of approval. Um, money, the Secretary of State for Health has said money won't be an issue. Uh, that was wrong in typical politician fashion. Uh, money has now s prevented two children being prescribed who got through those previous barriers. And the people paying for it, called the clinical commissioning groups, have said no. Um, we're just about to change the Secretary of State for Health probably today. So God knows what the new one will say. So that's another reason. Um, we've got a dreadful supply chain, as I mentioned already, individual importation. I hope you don't have that problem. And we've got the very muddly hemp-derived CBD, non-medicine, medicine issue, which is a complete mess. And you know, what is, because it's not a mess, it's not controlled. Often what's in the bottle is not what's in the bottle. People have shown that. There was one, uh, in a, there's a very well-known chain in the UK called Holland and Barrett. And they were selling a medicine that was 20 times the allowed level of THC. It quickly went off the shelves. <laughs> we were, buy it quick. Uh, so there are other points that are minor and probably just relevant to the UK, in fairness. So what do we need? Education. We need accessibility of the evidence. We need better guidelines, less restrictions, and include GPs. I'm very keen on we should must include GPs. And I think the whole thing needs to be controlled because of a different way of looking at evidence, a different way of looking at regulation by something equivalent to an Office of Medicinal Cannabis. And I think in the regulations that was going to be proposed, if I'm right. Uh, something equivalent in, the, in the New Zealand. Uh, so I think that's necessary because it doesn't fit into the pharmaceutical model, as I've said several times. So that's what I'd like to see eventually. Proper pharmacies staffed by knowledgeable people. I don't think we have to over-medicalize this, to be honest. Um, you know what they're talking about? The Canada, they call them bud tenders, I think is a great name. Um, people who know what they're doing. And why not, if they know what they're doing? to advise people on the subtleties that we've discussed today. A bit like Apple stores, aren't they? And there, I just thought that I should have put Boris Johnson there, shouldn't I? But he hasn't said anything useful, <laughs> ever, about anything. Um, but uh, Trump said that. He probably tweeted that at three in the morning and forgotten he'd done it, but that's what he said, so I'll, I'll keep to him that. the only good thing about him, um, I think. And I suppose I'd like to see eventually him coming along the lines of his, um, his <laughs> predecessor, George W. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>